presented uh, in a, outside hospital with sudden onset of breathing difficulty of few days duration, exactly three days duration, and uh, noticed to have a neck swelling. On examination, she had a pulse rate of 114 sinus tachycardia, and this was tachypneic, respiratory rate was 30, blood pressure was 110 over 60, saturation was 92% on room air. So next thing you'll ask for an ECG, ECG showed a sinus tachycardia and there was incomplete right frontal branch block. And a chest X-ray was done which showed a normal cardiac ratio with right mid zone opacity. And the echo was done, echo showed normal LV function, but there was orbit dysfunction, right ventricular dysfunction, moderate tricuspid relaxation with severe pulmonary artery hypertension. And there was an echogenic opacity in the origin of the left pulmonary artery measuring about 2.4 into 1.1 centimeter. So what is the diagnosis? Elderly lady, breathing difficulty, acute onset, having severe pulmonary embolism. So it is not sufficient just to say pulmonary embolism because the management differs according to the category of pulmonary embolism, whether it is a mild pulmonary embolism or it is a moderate or it is a severe. So this is the chest X-ray, and here you can see that uh, the right wind zone there is an opacity there. That's the right uh, wind zone opacity, and normal CT. Otherwise, left fields are clear. And this is the echo, and here you can see that uh, the density is more. So there is something mass sitting there. It should be like black. This is the main pulmonary artery. This is the aorta. This is the right pulmonary artery and this is the left pulmonary artery. At the origin of the left pulmonary artery you are seeing there is a extending to the segmental arteries with near total occlusion on the left side. And on the right side, acute thrombosis is noted in the right superior trunk and segmental arteries with partial occlusion. And there were pulmonary infarcts in the lateral segment of the right middle lobe and anterior segment of the left upper lobe and superior segment of the right lower lobe. So in the chest X-ray, what we saw, the mid zone opacity is nothing but a pulmonary infarct happened in this patient. And a lower limbus doctor was asked, which showed the left femoral vein subacute thrombosis. And here you can see, and that is the left pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery is the left pulmonary artery origin, and you can see that black color radiation, see that is the uh, thrombus in the left pulmonary artery origin. And this is yet another view which shows the thrombus. And this is another way of showing the thrombus there. And this is the short axis view. You can see that this is the main pulmonary artery, this is the right pulmonary artery, and the whole thrombus is there in the left pulmonary artery, extending into the main pulmonary artery. So, what generally uh, nowadays we have to ask for it once we know the pulmonary embolism, you have to ask for two things, mainly the cardiac eye markers. So, what is uh, Troponin I, you have to ask for a troponin I, cardiac eye marker. I will tell you the reason. Second thing is you have to ask for the NT Pro BNB. Basically, to know what is the myocardial damage that happened because of this pulmonary embolism. So, this patient has right ventricular dysfunction and this patient troponin I is 0 0.12. So, anything above 0 0.06 is significant. So, this patient has 0 0.12. That means there is myocardial necrosis. The right ventricular dysfunction is so severe that this patient has an NT-PRO BNB which is normally say below 500. Now it has gone to 10,949. So significant myocardial damage and significant increase in troponin I that indicates that this is not a simple pulmonary embolism. Why it is important because the management differs. So the diagnosis is acute submassive pulmonary embolism. So we divide the pulmonary embolism into mild category submassive category and massive category. Whenever a patient has hypotension, that is cardiogenic shock, 
then he will be called as massive pulmonary embolism case. When there is no hypotension, as in this patient, the blood pressure is normal, but this patient has RV dysfunction as well as myocardial necrosis. Either RV or myocardial necrosis with no hypotension is called submassive, but here we have both RV dysfunction is also there and there is significant myocardial necrosis by these two parameters. So this is called acute subacute submassive pulmonary embolism. So what is the treatment? Do you want to thrombolize or do you want to give anticoagulation only? So what do you think is the right choice in this patient? So there is clear only hepatitis. Okay. Uh, what the literature says, let's see. There is no contradiction as far as the treatment of pulmonary embolism with reference to both the extremes. Mild only heparin, massive thrombolysis. But when it comes to submassive like this, when the patient is hypotension is not there, patient is apparently hemodynamically stable, whether to thrombolysis or just give heparin. That is a controversial thing. There is so what the guideline says, let's see. So submassive pulmonary thromboembolism accounts for almost 20 to 25 percent of overall cases of pulmonary thromboembolism. The inhospital mortality in this patient is about 5 percent. The main problem which we face in these patients, if they survive, are the morbidity. They will end up in chronic pulmonary hypertension. Their quality of life can be impaired. They can have persistent right ventricular dysfunction, and they can have a future recurrent thromboembolism. And if you do thrombolysis in these patients, definitely we can improve the morbidity, but there is a risk of more intracranial hemorrhage and bleeding complication. To a certain extent, we can improve the mortality too. So this is of the various bodies uh, guidelines. American just physician uh, guideline which says First thing is no thrombolysis, the grade 1B, level of evidence is B, and the grade 1. But in selected cases, they recommend that you can thrombolyze and uh, the grade 2C. Similarly, if you see American Heart Association and European Heart Association, in selected cases, you can thrombolyze grade 2B. But American just emergency medicine, I mean American College of Emergency Physicians, they have said there is no definite evidence to make any recommendation at this point. So this is the guideline. So we have to select the case when we think of thrombolysis. So how we are going to select the case? So we have an index to see whether the given patient is falling into high risk category or medium risk category or low risk category. This is a simple thing. Whatever parameters you have just you have to apply, you will get the score. So the patient which I told has the score of 105 and she falls into a high mortality risk. The mortality risk at one month well, comes to about, if we go back, comes to about, she falls in risk uh, class 4, so it is about 11.44 to 11.4 at one month of mortality. So she falls into high mortality risk. So I decided to thrombolize because of this reason. Now the next question is whether you want to give full dose thrombolysis or you want to cut out the dose of thrombolysis, out of thrombolysis, so that you can reduce the bleeding risk. So what the literature says? There is a systematic review of uh, various uh, trials and meta-analysis of five randomized trials, which included over 144 patients. And they compared the full dose thrombolysis. What do you mean by full dose thrombolysis? As far as the uh, we have thrombolytic agents like streptokinase, age old molecule, then we have urokinase, then we have tissue plasma with an activator called tenectoplase. Of course, nowadays we have reticulase and tenectoplase. But reticulase and tenectoplase still FDA is not approved for uh, pulmonary embolism. So the first three agents are approved by the FDA for thrombolysis and pulmonary embolism. So if you take streptokinase, the full dose is we give 2,500. There is 2.5 lakhs uh, bolus followed by 1 lakh per hour infusion for 12 hours. And similarly, when you take tissue plasma with an activator, we give 100 milligram over 2 hours as IV infusion. 100 milligram, they give 10 milligram bolus, then the 90 milligram can be given as an infusion over 2 hours. This is called full dose thrombolysis. 
But when we say off source thrombolysis, it is 50 milligram of uh, alkaplase, that is tissue plasma is inactivated. So, when this trial, this meta analysis compared this full dose, the so called 100 milligram versus 50 milligram of uh, alkaplase, they found the efficacy as far as reduction in mortality and prevention of recurrent PTE, both are similar. But there is a tendency towards less bleeding when we give off dose. So, that is the inference we got from the meta analysis that off dose will do the work and will produce less side effect. And when they compared with only one oral anticoagulation, said only heparin versus an off dose thrombolysis, the two studies compared low dose or the off dose of alteplase and heparin alone. What they found, there was no difference in bleeding, there was no difference in all cause mortality, there was no difference in recurrent organic thrombolysis, but there was a high clot burden at one week after heparin alone compared to off dose thrombolysis. So the clot burden is high at one week time post uh, treatment in patients who have received only heparin as against off dose thrombolysis. This is from two studies, uh, Levinitron and Serifetron. So when we deal with such patients, we have to have a case to case basis approach. We have to monitor the patients with oral dysfunction closely and we should restrict thrombolysis only to high risk cases and then to off dose thrombolysis. And we should make sure that there is no contraindication to thrombolysis. And so such patients, first you start the heparin, follow them for a few hours, say four hours. And if patient oral dysfunction worsens or patient deteriorates, then consider immediate thrombolysis and then to off thrombolysis. And once to do the thrombolysis, you follow them by echo, look for the pulmonary arterial hypertension, whether it is coming down or not, look for the RU function, whether it is improving. And what is important is the thrombolysis in myocardial infarction and thrombolysis in pulmonary embolism little differs. In thrombolysis in myocardial infarction, first you have to give heparin, when you can stir uh, tissue plasma with an activator, then thrombolyze then immediately start with infusion heparin. But in thrombolysis and pulmonary embolism, you should take patient as received heparin, stop heparin, thrombolyze the patient, then wait for the activated positive thromboplastic tank to come to normal, below 80, then you have to start heparin. You should not mix heparin and uh, thrombolysis together in pulmonary thromboembolism because it increases the risk of bleeding. So that is important. This is venous system, that is arterial system. So thrombolysis can be performed as late as two weeks after the onset of the first symptom. So in pulmonary embolism, unlike in myocardial infarction where you have to thrombolyze, golden hour is one hour, so they say up to 12 hours maximum. But here up to 14 days of onset of pulmonary thromboembolism, you can thrombolyze if it is indicated. So what I did in my patient, I have gone off those thrombolysis, other place 50 mg, 10 mg bolus, 40 mg infusion over 2 hours intravenously and I checked an uh, APTT that is activated positive thromboplast time after the thrombo is over, surprisingly it was normal. So indirectly it tells the amount of uh, thrombus load. So the other place is even after starting the other place and given 50 mg, the APTT was normal. So immediately I started him on heparin and continues the heparin and monitored the APTT kept the FTT at least 2 to 2.5. Then once patient got stabilized, started on oral anticoagulant acetrome and maintained the INR of 2 to 2.5. Incidentally, you know, whenever uh, we come across an elderly lady with pulmonary thromboembolism, it is mandated to look for any secondary causes. So we did an ultrasound. Basically, ultrasound will tell you, is there any thrombus in the inferior ventricle also? And uh, it so there yeah, large hernia sitting there and CT abdomen confirmed that there is a large hernia sitting there and uh, any secondary causes like you no know, <coughs> silent malignancy can manifest with pulmonary embolism at this age. So did a mammogram and cancer markers which turned out to be normal. So to summarize, the recommendation is like this. If a patient has mild pulmonary, I mean, pulmonary embolism, just apparent is sufficient. If a patient has massive at the other extreme, there is no question you can straightly go for thrombolysis. But when patient has submassive pulmonary thromboembolism, then we are divided into two categories. 
patient has organ dysfunction, and patient has a troponin high phosphorus like this, and patient had a pro proximal DVT, that is left femoral vein had a blood clot, and that can move to the pulmonary artery any time. So such patients, if the patient falls into low risk for bleeding, then give low dose of underplates. So we have given 50 mg in this patient. So follow echo of this patient at the time of discharge so mild pulmonary artery hypertension and I repeated echo after two months, there is no pulmonary artery hypertension, RE function is normal. So the total duration of the anticoagulation is six months with the oral anticoagulation. So this is first case is over. I just go to second case. Newer oral anticoagulants in the primary treatment of P where there is no need for thrombolysis. Instead of heparin, can you use the new oral anticoagulants? Yeah. In the P, I mean uh, definitely not in acute state. Acute state? If, if, if you have a mild pulmonary thromboembolism, first you start with heparin, then you combine the this thing. But uh, starting with newer oral anticoagulant alone without heparin is not advisable. So first give heparin, then heparin, then we start with the follow-up with the oral, the newer oral oral. I purposely didn't touch that because the time is not Sir, what was the cause of pulmonary embolism in this case? In this case, it's like, so see, then I analyzed, I asked retrospectively, she has traveled to Madhuri and has come back. That is the only thing I can find out. So probably the DBT, DBT, that is what left femoral veins, she had a venous thrombosis. So probably that is the one that is triggered the What is the indication for surgical thrombectomy? Uh, at this point of time, the surgical thrombectomy role is very less. Uh, when we, the options like you know, patients who had uh, massive pulmonary embolism where there is contraindication for thrombolysis, then probably we can consider surgery, but surgery carries the mortality 50-50 chance. Wonderful, Dr. Srinivasan. Dr.